This is the Woke Daisy. Hello, TW Dears, and welcome back to a brand new episode of The Woke Daisy. I'm Nahal. And I'm Annika. And today we're talking about fast fashion. As many of you all know, I love fashion. It's showcased on my Instagram and my personal blog. I love seeing what the new and upcoming trends are and how I can incorporate them in my day-to-day. Some of my favorite stores include Zara, Misguided, Revolve, and so many more. The reason I love shopping at these online stores is because their styles are amazing, they're pretty cheap to afford, and after about two to three wears, I can get rid of them and buy something new. I'm sure many of you listeners do the same thing, But recently, I watched an episode of Hasan Minhaj's Patriot Act of fast fashion and got a reality check on what fast fashion does to the environment. Fast fashion does not support overall sustainability, so what happens to the environment when we're shopping at places like Zara and H&M? To teach us a little bit about fast fashion, the impact that it has on the environment, and dive into the decolonization of fashion, we're pleased to introduce Aditi Meyer. She's one of the key spokespeople for sustainable fashion and creating an inclusive and intersectional movement. She's the creative behind sustainable fashion blog Adime, which explores the ties between style, sustainability, and social justice. And she's also become a frequent speaker on topics like environmental justice, minority representation, responsible storytelling, and more. And our second guest is Karen Desai, co-founder of Look, an online rental service committed to giving everyone an equal opportunity to experience Indian culture through fashion. After attending about four to six Indian weddings each year and recently planning her own wedding, she felt the frustrations of the Indian retail experience. She either had to buy a flight to India to find modern styles or pay unreasonable prices at stores in Chicago. She was disappointed by the ways behind wearing a dress once and then letting it sit in her closet. She and her two co-founders are hoping to transform this experience for the modern Indian American. So thank you both for being on today. We're really excited. Thank you for having us. So we just want to start by asking, where did your passion for decolonization of fashion and sustainability come from? What are your core values right now? Yeah, so this is Aditi here of adding me. I guess I could start with my own journey um, with decolonizing fashion. So my journey in this space started about six years ago um, after the Rana Plaza factory collapse. So for those that are not familiar, in 2013, um, there was this eight-story garment factory within Bangladesh that was producing for some of the world's biggest retail fast fashion brands. So Zara, Primark, the H&Ms of the world. And one day, um, before this factory collapsed, they found structural cracks in the building and it was ordered to evacuate. So all of the corporate you know, offices on the first floor were um, evacuated, but there was so much upper pressure from upper management to have workers complete orders. Um, and when we think about the demographic that often makes up garment workers, they don't often have the luxury of forgoing a day's wage. So they returned to work and the next day the factory collapsed and it's coined the biggest industrial disaster of our time. Or as I like to say, the biggest homicide, just because we know that it could have been prevented as well. Uh, so from there, at that point, it was about 2013, going on 2014, and I was starting my college career. Um, my background, I was always very much into photography, and fashion was another means for me to kind of explore, you know, visual design and aesthetics. But Rana Plaza for me really became the catalyst to kind of interrogate just how much of the world's fashion supply chain exists on the backs of women and especially women of color globally. And so fashion for me really became a vehicle to interrogate larger systems at play, um, rooted in extraction and exploitation, and just how much that is intertwined with South Asian culture and identity as well. I actually didn't know about the factory collapse. Yeah, it's crazy. So I think it's one of those things, those that have more involvement within sustainability or fashion spaces, it's been on their radar. But yeah, it's de- it's like the triangle, you know, that triangle factory that happened in the US, like in the 20s or something. It's comparable to like that degree of, um, you know, disaster of our time. Over 1,100 people died, which is huge. And over 2,500 people were injured. 
And, you know, workers are still reeling from the impacts. Has justice been served? That's a question many people are asking, um, you know, almost seven years later. So that for me really became like a critical turning point of if I wanted to take a space in the fashion industry, how can we reimagine what this industry could look like? Oh, wow. I love that. How about you, Karen? Yeah. So um, it's actually ironic that you said that, but um, the shirtwaist, the tri- Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, uh, that building that it happened into, it was if my building at New York University when I was in college. So I, that's something that I was reminded of every day. Um, so very serendipitous as, that you mentioned that. Um, but actually my journey towards uh, becoming more and more passionate about sustainability happened more recently. So um, you mentioned my wedding uh, back in, yeah, last year, but I actually started planning it in 2018. Um, and so something that happened to me that really opened my eyes to waste, especially when it comes to fabric, is this process of shopping for Indian fashion in general. So when I was wedding shopping, I went to India to look for my own outfits. Um, but when I got there, I realized, oh, I have so many non-Indian family and friends. Um, I also need to shop for my husband because um, he's still not very t- uh, fashion savvy. So <laughs> I obviously had to do that for him as well. Um, but I came back with about six suitcases and over 40 outfits. Um, and while I should have been incredibly happy because it's a special moment when you're going wedding shopping, um, honestly, I felt a lot of disappointment. And it was because I knew that each of these outfits would probably be worn once maybe twice if we're lucky, and then just put in the closet for another 20, 30 years plus or thrown away. And it was then um, when I got back to the States and I talked to my two friends who are now my co-founders that we we really felt like there's just so much waste going on in the world. And if it's not us who will do something about this and try to change it, then and then who will, right? So that's where things have started back in 2018. And it's been a journey since then. And we launched Look, uh, a rental service to really change that kind of um, wastage um, back in January of, of 2020. So relatively new. My mind is being blown, namely because I'm also, you know, kind of thinking through outfits and things like that. And that's something that's vaguely been on my mind because I'm like, when am I going to wear these again? Right. And you know how it is in South Asian anything ever, any kind of big event where people get kind of like, oh, I've kind of seen you in that, you know, so you always want to be showing up in something new. And that's really tough. It really is such a waste, um, not only of money, but also of resources. Um, One of the things that I wasn't very familiar with, because I'm not quite as fashion savvy as Nahal is, I have much more of a classic old person look. Um, For like, you know, for our listeners who just don't know exactly what fast fashion is, can you give us a brief overview of what that is and why it's a big deal to be aware where we shop and the impact that it has on the environment? You've dug in um, a little bit about what your catalyst was to get into it, but what is the general landscape and you know why do we, why is it so important for us to know that? And honestly, I'm telling you, everything that I learned was from that Patriot Act episode. So hopefully you guys can explain it better. I don't know if anyone can explain it better than Hassan Minaj, but here's your chance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our king Hassan Minaj really came through. It was really cool to have that on the spotlight on such a big platform. But yeah, I mean, I could kind of take my shot at describing fast fashion. So fast fashion is a practice that is trying to produce um, fashion items at a scale as much as it can, as fast as it can, as cheap as it can. And so with all of those parameters in mind, it's clear that fast fashion is predicated on often a vulnerable workforce and not having a consideration of the environmental impact of fashion. So fast fashion prioritizes speed and quantity over anything else, whether that's quality, garment workers' rights, Um, And fast fashion often requires an output that is literally impossible. And so because these standards are known to be impossible, they often use violence as a means to speed up production. And that's why when you look at who often makes up garment workers around the world, it's tied to the most vulnerable communities. You know, in Bangladesh and in South Asia at large, like we've all heard stories of like predominantly women, often child labor. That's one face of it. But like in Los Angeles, where I am based and where I'm from, uh, we have a huge garment manufacturing scene here, one of the last in the US. Um, And it's something that most people don't know about because most of the industry is undocumented immigrants. And 
it's kind of like that by design because what I've seen in my own work with organizing alongside garment workers here is that when folks do speak out, they're threatened with deportation um, and things like that from their employers. So it really becomes a question of how the fashion industry is predicated upon like how they could kind of weaponize people's identities that are already part of marginalized groups. So aside from just fashion and your love for sustainability, I think that your voice is really for the people. Would you agree? Yeah, for sure. I think like my gateway, like as much as I love aesthetics and visuals, I've always been one that's had more like an activist heart. And I think, you know, sustainability and fashion, like that intersection has really allowed me to explore like visual culture through a lens of activism and, you know, liberation, (laughs) revolution. (laughs) Yes, let's let's encourage everybody to sort of uh, revolt on this because I definitely think it's worthwhile. What, you know, would you say that that's probably the biggest challenge or the problem or question that the fashion industry needs to tackle right now in terms of fast fashion is the fact that human rights are being violated um, in order for this, you know, in order for this production, this, this vast amount Totally. Yeah. I mean, for me, I think my gateway into sustainability was definitely the social justice impact of it in terms of seeing like the human lives that are sacrificed in this process. But I will say that like, I wasn't someone who was like totally into the environment, you know, like hugging trees. I kind of am now. (laughs) I've learned a lot in the last like five plus years, but I think we need different touch points because everyone's coming from such different places, right? For some folks that are more, you know, ingrained in maybe like woman rights and how like fashion is tied to like immigration, like all those little nuances. There's so many touch points that the fashion industry touches on. Um, For me, when it comes to like the biggest challenge, it's like, how do you get people to care, right? When it comes to issues of like uh, human rights exploitation, environmental degradation. And I think fashion is such an interesting medium because fashion is such a sexy medium. People are drawn to it, right? Like I could draw you in with like a cute Instagram photo or an outfit, but like use that medium to talk about more heavier, you know, pressing issues. Um, As far as your question on what I think the fashion industry needs to tackle, As you mentioned, definitely the human rights element. But I think overall, there needs to be a cultural shift because although fast fashion exists and there's all these terrible stuff, we also have to reconcile that there is a consumer demand of having things constantly, right? We also have to look at how we have a culture that's kind of complicit. So I think we need a cultural shift that can push everyone to consume less, which will lead the fashion industry to slowing down in scale and speed. Scale and speed are the two main elements of fast fashion being what it is. And then we also have to think about circularity in our economies. Right now, the system we have in fashion is extract, whether that's uh, environmental resources or labor, produce, consume, and dispose. But we're also thinking more about how can we create circular systems that kind of mirror nature. Nature doesn't have any Thing that goes to waste and i think that's like the lens that the sustainability world has been thinking about like even with like look studios like you know there's already so much out there how do we can like use that instead of like getting new stuff creating more waste etc that's incredibly incredibly just sort of powerful to to think about because there are like you said so many touch points and you know karen one of the things that you do through look is, you know, designing and sourcing and, you know, creating outfits and making sure that it does follow that process. So you're sort of on a different touch point than Aditi is talking about, which is kind of cool. So can you tell us a little bit about that and just sort of talk about what your experience has been in relation to all the points that Aditi has brought up so far? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as Aditi is talking, um, everything is resonating me, with me really, really close to my heart, um, actually. Uh, she mentioned that poor supply chain, right, um, in terms of the folks in Bangladesh, as well as India, who are often taken advantage of because of the low wages, the poor working conditions. Um, you know, in addition to that, though, there are two other things that are top of mind for us as look when it comes to fast, uh, fast fashion. Uh, the other is overwhelming wastage, right? And so actually today, Americans throw away over 14 tons of textiles a year. Um, and oftentimes that just sits in landfills, right? And they actually just don't go away. And, and, and that's just awful for the environment. And the third is really around greenhouse gas emissions um, and wastage of resources like water, right? There is so much wastage happening um, as a result of this throwaway culture. Um, and then also, of course, there's this terrible effect of the supply chain um, that's happening to 
the folks oftentimes in third world countries. Um, so these are all things that definitely resonate with myself and my co-founders. And in terms of uh, what we really want to change though, and what we feel like we have control in changing is this concept of the throwaway culture, right? And so today, social media mixed with fa fast fashion has made us believe that we need to buy more and we need to get that next piece that's that's part of the newest trend. And Aditi mentioned that really well. Um, but ultimately, these items are made so fast with inadequate materials, they can only be worn once, maybe twice, and then they're thrown away. So the fashion industry really needs to recognize these flaws and provide alternative options, right? And so one is rental, but there are alternative options out there. There's secondhand reselling, um, there's borrowing even. Um, and as what Aditi mentioned, it's also this idea of moving towards slower and sustainable fashion. Um, and so I think with Look, um, our main goal really is is to, to be part of eliminating that idea of throwaway culture and presenting rental as an alternative. So you can still wear the trendiest options, but you don't need to throw it away. It does not need to sit in your closet. Other people can benefit by wearing that same garment. And because it's worn multiple times, it's at an affordable cost. Because oftentimes people want sustainable items, but they just can't afford it because it's just priced so much higher than fast fashion. But the reason I wanted to kind of dive deeper into that is learn what are some other options besides renting with this whole throwaway thing. I know currently right now when I wear the clothes a few times, I'm over the style, I'm over the trend. What I do right now is I'm donating clothes. I'm going to places like Plato's Closet to give the clothes and earn some money or I'm just giving it to friends or posting them online on Poshmark or something like that. Are there other alternatives? Is that a good start to what I'm doing or what's a better way to... I don't know, get rid of my clothes or just try to put them somewhere else? Well, yeah, I think that is definitely a great start, you know, but I think something I always say is like, we all need to just be consuming less. And I know that's so much easier said than done. But the biggest thing about sustainability for me, I think sustainability lends itself to really knowing your personal style. When you go thrifting, right? Think about the experience when you go like secondhand shopping versus like Forever 21, which is doesn't exist anymore. So RIP, but like, you know, there's mannequins at these fast fashion brands that are visual markers of what you need to be buying. And I think this trend-based culture is almost like, we lose a sense of self and I think there's something a bit more personal. And when you have your own personal style, like you, you know what you like, you know what I mean? And I think that's the biggest shift I've seen in my own consumption habits from like high school versus now where I feel like I've developed a more innate sense of self um, and style accordingly. So that's one thing. Uh, when it comes to donations, I think so. I've I've written about this at large, or you can find um, an article about this on my website. But the donation world has its own like dark side too, because what it is right now is people in the West often feel like, oh, I could just consume as much as I want, and I could just donate it. Someone else in a third world country will use it. But there is so much, you know clothing that is going into certain countries in the quote unquote global south that even they're saying we need to put a stop it's destabilizing their global their local markets because their local textiles artisans designers can't compete with the low prices of all this inventory coming in and that said they also can't sell all of that there's just so much coming in so they don't even have the same sophisticated textile waste systems that we have in the u.s so it's actually contributing to more environmental degradation in other countries like Africa for or not a, continents like Africa or like other countries where things are being shipped so that's one thing to know so when it comes to like what we could do to more responsibly dispose of our clothes um, I am a big fan of clothing swaps getting all your friends together and being like hey I don't find use in this anymore but it's cute like and just exchange stuff that's a fun way think about can you upcycle or downcycle your clothes upcycling means like you know, making some um, changes to it so it's more in tune with your style. I know a lot of us have South Asian mothers with great like skills behind the sewing machine, which really comes in clutch or like using it as like a cleaning rag, right? It really demands that we need to pay more attention. And yes, it is more work, but I think everyone needs to have this shift of like, your clothes are going somewhere. Just because it disappears from you doesn't mean it just like disappears, right? It's in some landfill, whether that's in our own locality. Uh, but yeah, Plato's closets and like secondhand markets like that is great. Depop, Poshmark, those are all great of bringing new life. We really need to think about how we can extend the life. And when sustainable fashion, 
there is often a higher price point to it, which we need to acknowledge, but the whole thing is that you'll be consuming less. So it's quality over quantity. You could buy like 10 shirts from H&M at $10 each, but are they really gonna last you beyond a few months? These things are not made to last a lot of the time. So that's kind of like the shift we need as a consumer base of like thinking about longevity versus like, you know, short-term gratification and short-term wear, going beyond trend culture essentially. I think that's a great takeaway because the clothing swap thing is a really cool idea. I think I'm going to try to do that with my friends. I'm sure we have a ton of clothing that we could just swap and try something new. But I do want to ask you, how does your South Asian identity play a role in your relationship with fashion and sustainability? And since we're on the topic of being South Asian as well, and this kind of goes with look studio as well. How come there's a stigma behind renting? Like if I ask my grandparents like, oh, there's this new renting website that I can do clothing rental from. I'm going to try it out. They go, no, no. Why do you want to wear somebody else's clothes? Oh, yeah. Why do you want to do that? They would rather me spend money to buy it, but I'm all about the renting. So how does that kind of play a role in your South Asian identity? Yeah, that's a great question. And honestly, it's something (laughs) that I've heard so many times um, from aunties all over. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, all the aunties, you know, and and it is and really interesting. Um, they don't want to promote borrowing from someone else, and I think it is a generational difference, right? I think for us as millennials and and those who are familiar with things like Rent the Runway and Newly, mm-hmm. we are we've been exposed to this concept now for many many years, and at this point, um, I do think all of us are wondering why hasn't this really expanded to other cultures? Um, And we need that, especially with South Asian fashion, because we have less occasions to go go to versus American occasions, right? And so why invest so much in one piece that will likely go to waste? Um, So I think for aunties, perhaps, and the rest, rest of the folks that might be a little bit older, maybe in, they had multiple events to go to. Maybe they have built this wardrobe where they can mix and match, perhaps. And, you know, that's something that I'd still recommend, actually, just to add towards the, the clothes swap um, and borrowing is that idea of mixing and matching. Um, but for for us today, um, millennials specifically, I think we're, we're open to the idea of renting and we want to see it in the South Asian culture and fashion. Um, we need that today. I would rather rent only because I know that I'm going to have a year where all my friends are going to get married. So why would I wear the same thing or buy something that's so expensive when I could rent for every occasion? I've been telling people this all the time. I'm telling my parents and my grandparents, like, let me rent. I want to rent. But I just feel like you mentioned there's still this stigma with wearing somebody else's clothes, that being on somebody's body and things like that. I think a lot of it is, you know, you're passing your karma on to the next person. And I also think a lot of that is SES, because if you think about the fact that when we're back in the motherland, when you're giving clothes away, you're usually giving them away to people who have a lower SES than you like the maid that comes in to wipe your floors or the person who's coming in for cooking. So I think there's sort of an association of if you're taking from other people, then you've lost your pride a little bit and you've lost, you know, your resources and your sustenance and your proof that you can actually, yeah, your status. So I think that now, you know, there's, that that's probably contributing actually to this entire sustainability issue and all the different touch points that Aditi was mentioning about, because it's creating and propagating this entire concept of continuing to buy new clothes, as opposed to stopping the cycle somewhere and making us rent or borrow and kind of reducing the stigma as Nehal mentioned. How about you, Aditi? What's your South Asian identity playing a role in this? Yeah, well, first, I just want to like really reiterate what you said about it, like really intersecting with socioeconomic status. I think that's a huge thing of it. Like when we think about what we have been fed as a culture in terms of social mobility and being higher class, it's often tied to disposability, right? Like, oh, I could buy this, wear it once, and that shows my class. And If anything, I would argue that a lot of that is almost (laughs) colonial values. Like, think about how stuff wrapped in plastic is like another indicator of like cleanliness, right? Like sometimes you even see fruit and things like stuff that does not need to be wrapped. And it's just like, oh, it's cleaner. And we've almost lost touch of like ideas and understandings of cleanliness and status are so warped that we really need to interrogate that. But in terms of your question of how my South Asian identity plays into this whole relationship with fashion and sustainability, um, a few different ways. I think for one, coming from a culture 
and country that's still reeling from like colonization, a colonial hangover, like you could say, really positions me to see the way that colonial values became capitalistic values. You know, ideologies that were rooted in exploitation and extraction, whether we're talking about, you know, labor or natural resources. But with that said, I think the biggest thing is that so much of the fashion supply chain exists in South Asia, right? In terms of the fast fashion world, all of these like really bad factories and really bad conditions. So there's that side. But on the flip side, South Asia has always had such an amazing fashion industry. You know, we all know this. It was one that was defined by artists and craft and regional identities. You know, me being Punjabi, we have our fultaris, but it's like different. Like wherever you go, there's something regional and specific to that part of India. And then we also know that our parents grew up in an era where supporting local tailors, et cetera, was just part of it. It was just like part of how the fashion cycle worked. But when we look at history, right, this amazing artist and culture that we've had in South Asia was really taken a huge hit by the British Raj because some of the first models of fast fashion that we've ever seen in our world happened during colonization in India. And this is where my work starts to really interrogate our cultural roots because all of our cultures have been inherently sustainable. If you think about the ways that our grandmas and grandpas, even our own parents have lived, a lot of that intersects with the immigrant experience. I know for me coming from a working class family that did not I did not come from wealth like frugality was just part of the immigrant experience but it also intersects with cultural like you just think of you save plastic bags under your sink you know you have like the blue <laughs> yeah. tin like Danish cookie stuff for sewing supplies <laughs> all of those stuff Relatable. like yeah and it's so much ingrained in so many like universal immigrant experiences and it's like quirky but the other part of it it's like We've always been seeing stuff of like prolonging the life. And I think that is a way that I'm really trying to recapture in my world. Like sustainability isn't just buying some really expensive garment. It's really a mindset and a lens through which we understand that everything we own has a life and we have to try and prolong it. I often talk about like when people ask me who my sustainability heroes are, I like to joke like it's like my nana and nani that have like the same tote bag for the last 20 years and like their stuff, like the same suits and coats from India. And I think that's a really good example of like the sort of slowness that you could kind of embody, you know? All the, the talk about the sort of a colonial hangover is so true because think about one of the first things that Gandhiji said whenever Pakistan, India were trying to fight for their independence was make your own clothes. Stop, you know, stop fight, like stop trying, putting your money into a market that is completely led by the British to begin with, but also kind of stop fast fashion in its tracks even back then and start becoming more independent and utilizing things that you can use over and over again because that's how you build your economy and kind of build your pride up again so I think we've sort of lost that and you know it's like you said we're just still kind of reeling from the last 70 years 80 years of trying to fight for our independence and and not completely taking that value to heart yeah I'm so so glad you brought that up so Kadhi like that material is what Gandhi that was a huge literal and like symbolic tool of resistance against the British Empire. It was like, we are not going to give money to the colonizers. We could create our own localized economies using natural fibers. Like that in itself is a radical act of resistance that also helps fuel money in your own communities and is good for the environment. And so with that in mind, that's a huge part of it. And then also looking at like, we look at colonial trade routes 150 years ago, in terms of like the East in India company and all that, that was owned by the colonial empire. It's literally the like fashion brands today, the fast fashion brands, their supply chains are mirroring those colonial truths 150 years ago during the height of the British empire. And so colonialism is a major lens through which I understand the fashion industry because these systems didn't really go away. They just kind of reinvented themselves of what the fashion industry looks like today. And I think they're better hidden now, too. You know what I mean? You really kind of have to look because this is something that Nahal and I and we pay attention to fashion. But at the same time, you know, these aren't necessarily things we catch right away, which means that they're constantly evolving and they're getting kind of better hidden and sort of camouflaging themselves in a lot better. Aside from just a South Asian representation, what about women in color representation? I know it's crucial to all of us. That's a topic that's very near and dear to our hearts. And also, 
I think Annika and I have actually made it a bigger effort now to look at those small South Asian businesses and find women of color who are business owners running their small businesses and trying to purchase items from them. And I know this one's going to be a great one for you, Karen. So feel free to take it. Yeah, absolutely. I would say two things um, t- are very important to to myself and, and my team. Um, one is women of color representation in how we actually represent our brand, right? Um, so we want uh, people to know that Indian fashion is possible to be experienced by anyone from a different background, right? And so, for example, in terms of pro- portraying fashion and whether it's an Indian brand or whether it's an American brand, we firmly believe that women of color representation should be seen um, by how the models are being chosen, right? And how they're also portraying the clothes because consumers want to see themselves in in the clothes that they want to wear, right? And, and I think that is incredibly, incredibly important for fashion brands and the fashion industry to ensure that they're doing. And that is something that we're very passionate about. And I guess the second thing is, to your point, um, we want to support the the workers um, in India because we have a, a tie to India, especially um, whether they're women or men. To be frankly, to be frank, it's it's something that is important to us because we want to give back to the motherland and the country that inspires us every day. And because we own our supply chain and because we're making our garments ourselves, uh, we do ensure that we provide fair wages there. We ensure that our workers are in a, a proper environment um, and the right conditions. Uh, we we feel very passionate about that as well. I know you collaborate with a lot of people, Aditi, who are women of color and clothing on your blog has shown that. What do you think? Yeah, for sure. I think similar to Karen, like a bigger, a very big goal of my content in terms of the brand collaborations I do is making sure that they are BIPOC owned uh, a lot of the time. And I think going back to the question of why is like women of color representation so crucial for sustainability specifically, it's because women of color are disproportionately affected by the current state of the world, which is unsustainable, right? Which are the first frontline communities that are affected socially and environmentally. And I think in the West, sustainability often becomes purely a luxury market thing, like a consumer act, which is not to say that's inherently bad, but I also think we need to be seeing sustainability as a lifestyle, a mindset, as I already touched on. So true sustainability needs to be a cultural shift. And I think that because women of color and communities of color have been disproportionately affected especially considering the history of colonialism that I just talked about. That's why we need women of color leading the charge of what sustainability looks like, because it's inherent to our ancestry. And I think it's something that a lot of our communities have held and we're all kind of in a period of reclaiming that. Um, And so we need to kind of define sustainability on our own terms. I love that. Oh, gosh. Yeah, no, I think that, you know, Nehal and I have done a lot of episodes on um, social justice, but I know for me, social justice is sort of, and women's rights in particular, are like so close to my heart and they're like the thing that light me on fire. So it makes me so happy to hear that, you know, you kind of taking this from that angle and, and really recognizing like, and, you know, really taking a stand on the fact that women of color are the most affected by any kind of crisis in the world, any kind of awful situation at work, any kind of you know, policy change, they're always the first and they're sort of the front lines of all of that. So it's, uh, it's incredibly important to, to really be cognizant of where our fashion is coming from and where it's going. Um, now I'm going to uh, switch gears really quickly back to you, Karen. Um, they see rental companies have sort of been on the rise lately. Um, I've been seeing them everywhere, but you know, a lot of people are becoming more aware about the environment and the need to be sustainable, as as you can tell, because we've been doing this podcast episode. Um, so, what sort of sets you apart from competitors? You're absolutely right. Um, the Indian and rental market is definitely growing right now, uh, but most of the players in this space are working specifically with designers. So what that means is they don't have control on what fabrics to use or what styles to create. So unlike them, we actually own our supply chain and and we create our styles um, 
based on what we decide. So with this control, we we choose, we test high quality and sustainable fabrics. Um, we make things adjustable with straps uh, so that we can be ensure ourselves to accommodate multiple sizes. And we, like I said already, uh, we also get to pay, pay our workers fair wages directly. Um, so what we think is our greatest competitive advantage is developing that private look label um, that's modern, adjustable, um, and have has that high quality fabric. So how exactly does it work? So do I give you a design that I find on the internet that I like and you create it for me and I rent it out? Or do you have a bunch of designs already ready available to rent out with new styles? Um, yeah, so... Really great question. So we actually do um, polls on Instagram about every two to three months, and we will basically put a bunch of styles up. So it could be um, two different types of capes, asymmetrical or one that kind of gets thrown over your back, right? It could be bell sleeves or it could be off the shoulders. We do all sorts of types of styles, and then we pull our Indian American consumer because I think that's what's really important. Most rental services today are... Um, sourcing from Indian designers in India who tend to create styles for that Indian consumer. The Indian American tends to want that fusion style, right? And not to mention, we have a lot of non-Indians who are have been married in or who are part of our family or friend set that also want to be finding these styles too. So we are doing these polls to really understand that Indian American and the American mindset when it comes to Indian fashion. And then we go ahead um, and we take those those uh, thoughts and styles, and we bring them to India. And actually, my co-founder, Kinney, um, has a design background, and she'll really start working with the folks on the ground in Mumbai to bring that to life. I'm going to have to hit you up when I go to Annika's wedding <laughs> so I can rent something. <laughs> oh, we would love to okay. help you. <laughs> I love that instead of being like, Annika, you should do this for your wedding. She's like, listen, when I go to Annika's wedding, I would I like to be to you. I'm like, okay, it's for the environment, Annika, OK? <laughs> <laughs> One of the biggest fast fashion brands out there is H&M. Aditi, you've written so many blogs about it, about your thoughts around the CEO, the company, what it's doing to our planet. T.W. Dears, definitely go check out her blog. We've mentioned it a few times. But in a recent turn of events, Sabia Sachi, something that I'm obsessed with, has decided to have an H&M and Sabia Sachi collection. I was really excited about it because I thought that was pretty cool, but it kind of makes you raise an eyebrow. How is a fashion brand that's luxury competing or collaborating, I mean, with a fashion brand that's fast fashion. So what are your thoughts on this? By the way, you had a, I wouldn't call it a rant, but you had a little <laughs> video that went that went viral, basically, from Brown Girl Magazine about you talking about this subject. And I watched it, and that's exactly why I chose you to be on this podcast, because I was just blown away. I mean, I actually ended up reposting it and changing my mind about how happy I was about H&M and Sabia Sachi. So for those people who don't know, can you tell us a little bit about your rant? So for those, I mean, I think Sabia Sachi is like a brand that's pretty much a part of the South Asian fashion consciousness. If anything, like the whole fashion consciousness. It's a big brand. And I mean, Sabia Sachi is a brand I have a lot of respect for. They're kind of like the gold standard when it comes to bridal culture. Like, you know, all of these A-list celebrities in Bollywood wear them. But the part that might not be so front of mind for a lot of folks is that Sabia Sachi and the Sabia Sachi Foundation um, is very intentional about employing Indian artisans and kind of reviving a lot of these crafts that are dying and creating a market for it, right? And so that has always been the cornerstone of what Sabia Sachi stood for is like slow fashion that like takes its time to be made and really, you know, um, looks to empower the South Asian artists and pay them fairly, etc. H&M, on the other hand, is kind of like the face of fast fashion in terms of creating as much as they can, as fast as they can, as cheap as they can, right? And so this whole collaboration hasn't been released yet, but I am very curious in what this will look like because if Sabia Sachi's is predicated on like artisan goods, how can artisan goods be made in a mass production type of way? Like those two practices seems like they're at odds with the other. There's like inherent tension there, right? Uh, another major question is what will ethics look like in this case where the, you know, the conditions that fast fashion has been made in specifically with H&M has been, you know, at the expense of a lot of human life. So what is this gonna look like? And although that rant was kind of like, I don't understand like what is happening. I think there is room, like I don't wanna be someone that's a purist and just like, you know, 
if anything has H and up on it, like just boycott it. I think it's important to ask questions and think about the reforms we could bring into the fast fashion world. But as it currently stands, fast fashion is inherently unsustainable unless they make major overhauls and slow down production and think about circularity. You could use organic cotton in like a collection, but if 90% of your profit model is from like traditional fast fashion that isn't thinking about any of these things about people on the planet, like where does that lead you? You know, it feels like a bit of a shot in the dark. So I'm just curious on what it would look like, but the two brand ethos are a bit at odds as it currently stands. I've seen a lot of brands, I don't want to say a lot, I've seen a few brands actually say that they're sustainable, great for the environment, but only like 10% is actually sustainable and great for the environment. Do you think a lot of times brands kind of overcompensate for how much they're actually doing by just writing that? Oh, totally. So that's what I call in the industry calls greenwashing because like sustainability is so sexy now, right? Like we're in a climate crisis, so everyone needs those marketing points. And because there is no industry agreed on definition of what ethical or sustainable fashion is, it's more like umbrella terms. Everyone's just throwing around these terms um, as they see fit. And so I think it's really important for consumers to interrogate, like if a brand is calling themselves like sustainable or ethical, well, explain what does that mean for you? And instead of it just being a one-off side collection, like H&M's Conscious Collection, um, that's like, you know, a very small percentage of their overall production. Like, are you actually making major changes in your supply chain? And do you own your supply chain? I think it's so great that Look Studio owns their supply chain. That's one of the most important things a brand can do is kind of own the means of production so they could really understand what's going on within their factories, et cetera. So then, Karen, what's your biggest challenge with manufacturing then? Because this is a really big responsibility to put on yourself and sourcing and making sure that all of it, the entire process is ethical is tough. So when you're seeking out quality fabric and when you're making sure that your workers are being paid appropriate wages and things like that, what's the biggest challenge that you face? Absolutely. So yes, you're right. So since we manufacture in India, we've been spending a lot of time educating our partner factory and trying to test sustainable fabrics. Um, the challenge there is that with embroidery and beadwork, some of these fabrics might not be durable when it's reused, when it's rented. Um, so that's actually why we're in the middle of an exploratory phase uh, where we're focused on two things. The first being that um, we're testing what fabrics will hold up for those reuse, reuses and rentals along the way. And then the second is um, how will these fat fabrics that we actually use impact the environment um, after its useful life of about five to 10 wears. So we've been really, really focusing on testing and something that we we really hope to get is honestly more guidance, more mentors, um, and just having people around us being able to support us in figuring out what are those right fabrics to use. Because there are a lot of uh, sustainable Indian fashion brands out there, but a lot of those brands tend to be focused on the everyday wear or the casual wear. And for us, we, we do want to provide options for occasion wear, right? To weddings, to engagements, to baby showers, et cetera. Um, but it's, it's been hard to find examples in the industry uh, for, for brands that do that. So we are testing. We want to learn more. Um, we hope that we can constantly iterate and improve. Um, but we're, we're hoping to maybe set that standard or, or get guidance as we move along the way. In one of your interviews that you did, Aditi, you did it for J. June magazine, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. You said that you practice and only wear sustainable fashion. And this is because of your collaborations with all these brands. I know we mentioned that earlier at some point too. But for someone who is a regular consumer like myself and Annika, what are your recommendations on how we can look at clothing differently or what kind of brands to go for? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I definitely want to like preface with like, I always acknowledge that I'm operating from a place of privilege because I have access to all these brands. And so I'm not one to be like, oh, if you don't have a completely sustainable closet, like what are you doing? Like, no, <laughs> uh, but yeah, in terms of the regular consumer, as I said before, one is consume less. And I know this requires a whole shift because we are not socially conditioned to do that from a very young age. It's always like buy more and more and more, a status symbol, you know, like retail therapy, all of these things. We have been fed this narrative as a society to have a very weird relationship with consumption where it's seen as an act of self-care or an act of love. Like think about Valentine's Day, really interrogate that. That's gonna take time. I, I acknowledge that, but that's the first thing. Um, secondhand markets, renting, everything we've been talking about 
throughout this episode, frankly. I think those are great starting points. And then when you are looking to make a purchase potentially that is new, like you want to own something and you don't want to just do something secondhand or rented, really do your homework, but there's different umbrellas of what sustainability looks like. There's like the artisan sector of supporting like handmade, um, like the artisan side of things that India is full of. Uh, there's zero waste fashion brands that are like even making sure that the small scra like scrapes of fabric that are left over gets incorporated into the design somehow. There's that. Uh, something I love doing is even going through my parents' old clothes. Like I found my dad's bell bottoms from like the 80s and like my mom's old like shawls and stuff. We have such amazing heirlooms because our, fa our the fashion that our parents and grandparents have is from a point where things are made with quality that doesn't really exist anymore. So even shopper closets, you know? And so there's all these options that we have as consumers and really explore the different domains. But as I said before, when it does come to like buying sustainable and ethical, we do have to reorient our understanding of what a good price is. Like it's gonna be at a higher price point and I acknowledge that there is uh, more difficult conversations that lie there in terms of access um, and who is this market for. But we also have to understand that we're buying with quality and timelessness in mind rather than just trends you know how can the fashion industry become more accessible and inclusive because i think you mentioned one really good point is that we come from a place of privilege when we talk about being able to shop for brands that are sustainable because sometimes like you said the price point is higher so what are things outside of fast fashion that the fashion industry can do to become more accessible and inclusive and you know appealing for people who are just like listen I just need clothes and you know I just can't afford this yeah so um from my perspective I think the fashion industry needs to become more accessible inclusive and that can really be done through education um, and it's up to brands like myself and many others to drive awareness of where are the clothes coming from um, we need to better understand also how brands are making the clothes right and so fabrics, um, the people behind it, transparency is key. The second thing though, uh, you know, in terms of accessibility, brands need to become more affordable. And that is tough when these sustainable fabrics and processes from a business perspective does cost a lot, right? And so I think there needs to be a balance here in terms of um, innovative solutions, right? And so could there be more sustainable platforms in terms of allowing consumers to see all the sustainable options out there for American or Western brands, as well as South Asian brands, right? There aren't many out there. And I think this is going to be the future, to be frank. And I think this is where we're going to see the rise in, in fashion innovation in the next 10 years. Um, I also think that's why we're seeing this current surge of rental solutions. Um, accessibility is key, and that can be primarily made through affordability. And rental is, is a really great way to do that. Um, but in general, I think businesses really need to work on, on closing the gap between, between intention and action. Many of us today already know what sustainability means and what it looks like and what needs to change, but a lot of people are not taking action. So it's up to businesses like Look, like myself, to really drive that education and transparency to make this change. And and I hope that's what we're going to do. We just launched in January, but we have a journey ahead, and I want to make sure we accomplish that. Well said. Uh, we are definitely in support of both of you and both of the missions that you guys are on to change perceptions about fashion and to get people to really think about where their fashion is coming from and what impact it has on humanity as a whole and their societies and the economy and a million and one other things, as you said, Aditi, and as you've mentioned as well, Karen, we were so, so happy that you guys were with us. Do you guys have any final thoughts before we wrap up? Yeah, um, I think I just want to give a, a big shout out to Aditi, to be frank. We need more people like Aditi in the world, not just to educate consumers, but to educate businesses like ours as we grow. We want to be sustainable, but in the Indian fashion space, this, this area really needs support from experts. To be frank, a lot of people who I see that are experts are really representing the Western world, but we need that same representation um, in, the, in the fashion industries across different cultures. So Aditi, thank you for doing what you do. And, and honestly, you've taught me a lot today, and I hope that I can continue to learn more from you in the future. And and thank you, uh, Woke Desi, for having us. This has been so much fun. And like I said, learned so much. So thanks again. 
I am going into my parents' closet after this. So thank you <laughs> for reminding me how many great things we already have and how it's not necessary to keep buying just because we have to fulfill this mentality and how it really is a change that starts with us. Yeah, thank you all. Of Karen, you're, you're doing amazing work. I'm really excited to follow closely. And yeah, thank you to Wolf Daisy for having us. This was such an amazing conversation to kind of like straddle my world of seeing it from like the consumer and activist end, but also like the brand perspective. And we're all doing amazing work to push the conversation. And it was great to talk to you all. And that's a wrap, everyone. Thank you guys again for being on today's episode. I've learned so much and definitely plan on implementing small changes in my life to be more environmentally conscious when it comes to fashion. Make sure to follow both Aditi and Look Studio on Instagram. Check out Aditi's blog, Rent Something from Look, and follow us at The Woke Daisy on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Like we always say, get woke, stay woke. This is the Woke Daisy.